Tibet is on the other side of these mountains, and it's Tibetism that for the last thousand years has ordered the way of life for this whole area. My aim in coming here was to experience something of what it means to be a Buddhist monk. But first, I wanted to see more of the way that Buddhism fits into the whole jigsaw of Nepal. Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, is basically Hindu. Hinduism and Buddhism have coexisted here ever since the birth of the Buddha. He was born as a Hindu prince 600 years before Christ. At first sight, Hinduism with its whole pantheon of gods and Buddhism with its singleness of purpose may seem strange partners, but Buddhism springs directly out of the mainstream of Hindu tradition and thought. Nepal's always been a place of pilgrimage for both Hindus and Buddhists. And since they lifted the ban on Westerners some 20 years ago, many different pilgrims come here for many different reasons. Perhaps the biggest is that it's an open system, tolerant of other people's creeds and ways of life, and with an attitude to religion that makes it part of the everyday fabric of things. <laughs> The architecture echoes this coexistence. It's hard to tell Hindu from Buddhist. The marvelously carved wood over the temple doors contains images from all sources. The painted eyes of the Buddha are everywhere, but surrounded by Hindu gods. The elaborately carved struts usually end in a pediment with a frankly sexual theme. The same artist may have carved on the neighboring strut a Buddha. Both Hinduism and Buddhism accept the raw facts of creation and of death without false modesty or squeamishness. For the monks and the mystics, the burning of a human body is seen not as a time for grief or disgust, but as a moment for meditation on the transitoriness of life. Just outside the city is one of the most holy places to the Buddhists, Swambunat. It's on a great natural mound, and at the top is another man-made mound, topped again by the eyes of the Buddha. The base is circled by a ring of prayer wheels, and although they carry the universal Buddhist prayer, Om Mane Padme Hum, it's quite usual to find Hindus worshipping at the Buddhist shrines. They turn the prayer wheels without any of that innate reserve that might stop a Protestant from crossing himself in the Catholic Church. For us, it's strange to find that the Hindus and their gods have a natural place here in the courtyard of a Buddhist monument. This is a Hindu temple consecrated to a god who's the protector of children. If you look closely at the walls, then you'll find effigies of the Buddha. What's now Hindu almost certainly started out as Buddhist. On the other side of the city is another giant Buddhist monument. It's so simple a shape that the sheer mass of it doesn't hit you until you're close to. There's certainly been a mound on this site for a thousand years, probably longer. It's solid, and right at its core, relics of the Buddha are supposed to be buried. Ever since Buddhism was established in Tibet, the Tibetans have been coming here as pilgrims. The ones that you see now are mostly old, and mostly refugees. With the Buddha, they believe that life is suffering, that the cause of suffering is desire, and that the only way to break this vicious circle is to follow eight rules. This eightfold path consists of right views, intention, speech, action, livelihood, and of effort, mindfulness, and concentration. 
This is the bedrock of Buddhism, a set of rules simple to describe, but as difficult to live up to as the Ten Commandments. For the world's 500 million Buddhists, the Eightfold Path consists in the main of right intention, speech and action. For the select few who have mastered this, to enlightenment is through the ways of effort, mindfulness and concentration. On this hill, Kopan, just outside Kathmandu, Tibetan monks built themselves a monastery in the traditional style. It's only been there for about four years. It's linked to a sister monastery in the Himalayas. In the summer, the young novices come down from the high mountains to stay. Most of them are Sherpas, but some of them are Tibetan. For all of them and their families, it's an honor to be selected. From about the age of five, they're plunged straight into a life of contemplation, meditation and prayer. The fulcrum of a monk's life is meditation. Under the guidance of his teacher, he has to experience the intense aloneness of it. And so, when they come together in prayer, it's as an extension of their experience of solitary meditation. Each one inhabits his private inner world, and yet they're in harmony with each other. There's more to the mantras that they chant than the literal meaning of the words. The whole mantra is felt to vibrate with life. And the vibrations set up can bring the monks through to an experience of the ultimate reality. For them, it's something indescribable, ineffable, to be approached only obliquely through words. One translation is the radiant light. It seems to be a state where all dualities dissolve into a perception of oneness with everything, perhaps literally to be tuned in to the absolute. Many of these monks will have spent three years in solitary meditation. They seem to exist on a different time scale that makes a ceremony that may go on for a whole day just a fleeting episode in their lives. singled out from the village children when he was three or four years old. He's thought to be the reincarnation of an illustrious monk. Playing outside, he seems to be an ordinary, bright little boy. But here, something else takes over and he passes naturally into a state that the others can't yet reach. 
The essence of the monastic life is solitude. This nun has just come out of a month's meditation in silence. The only person that she spoke to was her teacher. Her meals were brought to her in this hut. She's a Canadian, Anne McNeil, about 40 years old and one of the founder members of the monastery. She told me that before she came here, her life was almost wholly sybaritic, given over to the pleasures of the senses. I used to be a ski instructor. Um, I thought the most exciting thing to do was to uh, climb out of a helicopter on top of a mountain and ski down virgin snow, nice sunshine, powder snow skiing, or sit on a beach in Greece and uh, meet beautiful people, talk about everything there was. And, uh, I really enjoyed uh, the sun and the sea and having a good time. In fact, uh, if it wasn't fun, I didn't really, I wasn't really interested in doing it. And, uh, so I was always looking for uh, something to exhilarate the mind and excite the mind. And, uh, I'm still looking. And I think I'm getting very close to finding what I've been looking for. What happens is that I, by meditating and contemplating and learning how to concentrate my mind onto a certain object so that I become the object then I begin to understand the object, whatever it is. And I begin to understand it with feeling. It's just not a mental speculation. It's with a feeling. And the more deeply I become skilled in meditating, then the more deep is the feeling, and the deeper goes the knowledge. I get far more than I ever bargained for. This occupation uh, is not just one lifetime, it's many, many lifetimes. And the fact that it's limitless is sort of mind-blowing. There's no limit to what the mind can do. I just wish I uh, would be in control of uh, my mind when I die, because that's very important. If you learn what death is about, then uh, there's no fear to anything if you understand it. Anne McNeil is one out of a group of 20 Europeans who were staying at the monastery. In fact, the main purpose of the place is to provide teaching to people from the West. They run two six-week courses each year. The Tibetan monks teach them the basic Buddhist doctrines and, above all, how to meditate. One thing that struck me was that this seemed to have given them a special sort of aliveness, as if they'd stumbled across a secret. They looked on every act of meditation as a voyage and seemed as intent on their exploration of inner space as any astronaut. I was nursing for four years, and after that I spent a year just doing you know, small things, you know, nothing important, and then we started travelling. The meditation course that happened to be starting just as we arrived here, I didn't know it was going to be about Buddhism, and it sounded interesting, so we stayed. And after the course then it seemed to all make sense. The retreat that I did afterwards was for three weeks, and means that you just live by yourself completely for those three weeks and meditate all day and constantly meditating your mind where you don't have any distractions with what's going on outside and your mind starts looking inside and you look back on your life and see what you've done and where it's taken you. For me it was very calming and peaceful and I felt that I was different and lived differently afterwards. The way to find the solution is given, but the actual solution you have to find yourself. I wasn't aware of religion at all until I sort of picked up a penguin Buddhism or something. 
I'd been to a sort of Buddhist society in London and I went to sort of lectures on Buddhism and Sufism and things around the place. I really had my mind blown, you know, far more than I ever anticipated on the, on the first meditation course. Yeah. It wasn't really till this trip that I became aware of people on such colossal difference of levels, you know, mm. just how fantastically wise and liberated people can be, you know, it's coming in touch with this and just more and more seems to open up. And the, 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 the horizons are sort of beyond all comprehension. It's a magical mystery tour, you know, sort of going to, I won't know till I get there, you know. <laughs> Until about a year ago, I was practicing medicine. Somehow, I wasn't as convinced as most of the others that practicing medicine was the answer. I went to religious school for 10 years, mm -hmm. Presbyterian school. And we had assembly each morning with prayers and hymns and some religious instruction, but it was actually quite meaningless. It was never explained what it was about or why we were doing it. I've heard it said by some of the lamas who have spoken to people who have used LSD that the experiences they have are comparable to some experiences people have at high levels of meditation but when you're using a drug then you come down and also as I said you have no control over what's happening while you're under the effect whereas in meditation you can actually do what you like now that I understand a little about Buddhist philosophy and psychology nothing I was ever taught is uh, disproves Buddhist philosophy and that Buddhist philosophy can include everything I was ever taught and far much more Before I came out east, I was at art college for a year in Farnham, but found it too restricting. I had a lot of time to myself, I had a room which I used to lock myself up in and spend a lot of time on my own, and just Buddhist books came my way. <laughs> I spent a month and a half in Kathmandu. Just one day by chance I happened to meet somebody who said there was a meditation course up at Kirpan. Really, that is what I came out east for to find some form of, of meditation and teachings. <laughs> I was into pot, but I gave that up really when I left England. The thing that doesn't let me down is meditation. Really, at the moment, my meditation is a contemplation upon the teachings which I have received at Copan. Just going over the teachings and contemplating upon them so that I understand them. It's really just in the very basic form, just sitting down, closing your eyes and thinking about the Dharma. Very basically, the Dharma is the truth, the reason why all this exists. Everything you see, everything you touch, everything you feel, everything you taste. The biggest barrier for most of them is language. The images and the concepts of Tibetan Buddhism are so rich that it seems only too easy for Westerners to gain the illusion of understanding rather than the reality. And yet, the customs and the ritual itself can seem so strange, so alien, that it's difficult to penetrate past surface impressions. Most of these monks are geshes, the Tibetan equivalent of doctors of philosophy. Their strange debating style goes back, through Tibet, to the great Buddhist universities founded 1,500 years ago. Like our modern philosophers, they're still debating the existential idea of being, how it can never be defined or characterized in any concrete way. They see the idea of the external world as the invention of our own consciousness, a world experienced as real, but in fact nothing more than an extraordinary large-scale hallucination. A hallucination so seemingly real that you can reach out and touch it. 
我听有些，爹奶奶那七八，干七八，中一天，谁比今天七八了？Many of these novices will stay with their monastery for the rest of their lives. But their vows aren't binding. They're free to leave when they're of age, and many do, in order to marry and bring up a family. But while they're in the monastery, there will be one constant thing in their lives, absolute obedience and allegiance to their teacher. It isn't just a question of school discipline, but rather the need to find a master to guide them safely through the pitfalls of meditation. Ravatang if you want to get up into the mountains to Tangbochi Monastery, then there's only one way, on foot. You can fly part of the way, but the plane will set you down in a region where the locals know the difference between a helicopter and a monoplane, but have never seen a wheel. From then on, everything is carried on a man or a woman's back. The loads are staggering, 50 or 60 pounds for a 10 hour journey at heights ranging between 9 and 14,000 feet. This is the route through to the high peaks, to the magical names, Amadablan, Kangtega, Lotse. five or ten miles you come to a tea house. After the cold clean air outside it's pretty choking. They don't have chimneys and you breathe a gamey mixture of tea, wood smoke and unwashed humans. People don't bother with washing much up here, and they accept lice and fleas as junior partners in their world. The Sherpas in the area are Buddhist and they look on all life as sacred. It's very near to the medieval Europe, where a saint could call his body lice pearls in the crown of God. <laughs> This is a garden of Eden, but not everything in it is lovely. Even the mountain water that looks so pure can't be drunk without boiling. There's a full house of infectious diseases in the mountains. 
smallpox, typhoid, typhus, pneumonic and bubonic plague, and very often the bodies of people who die this way are thrown into the water to find their rest in the deep pools. This easy contact with death seems to strengthen the place of Buddhism in their lives. Even the rocks that you walk past are carved with prayers in Tibetan. As you walk up the trail, prayer walls bisect the paths. The act of walking past the wall is a prayer in itself. Like the Tibetans, they've an inventive genius for the earthly mechanics that press all motion into the service of prayer. The movement of their bodies past the stones, the wind through the prayer flags. An ordinary peasant woman will devote hours to circling the prayer flags, counting off each revolution on her beads. With each round, she gains additional merit. Even the water's pressed into service. Here, water wheels generate prayers rather than electricity. Just below Tangboche Monastery and on the route to Everest is the village of Kumjung. The Sherpas from the village are famous as mountain porters and they've taken part in all the attempts on Everest since Hillary first made it with Tensing 20 or more years ago. Their two-storey houses are built with dry stone and a heavy plastering over of the local clay. There's snow here for seven months of the year and the walls have to be thick enough to keep out the bitter cold of the winters. This is the main room of a typical Sherpa house in Kumjung. All of their days start with prayer. The first thing is to make an offering of water at the family shrine. And then incense of juniper leaves is put on the charcoal of the incense burner. Huge copper pots around the wall are a tangible sign to everyone in the village that this family is comparatively well off. After the rooms have been blessed, the final act is to turn the prayer wheel. It's as natural a part of their life as lighting a fire in the morning. The Sherpas have a liberated attitude to sex. It's no shame to have an illegitimate child and no handicap to marriage later on. Infidelity is accepted in a very relaxed way. There's a token fine, but it's hardly thought of as grounds for divorce. Marriage for them centers around much more serious things than sex, like property, bringing up a family, working the land. It's quite usual to find a woman married to two or three husbands at the same time, often brothers. It seems to work out most amicably, and it does mean that there's usually one man around while the others are off earning money as guides in the mountains. Apart from guys like Tenzing, the most famous man in the village is a painter, Kappa Kaldun.
His great-grandfather and his father were painters, as is his son and his grandson. His grandfather was the first to paint the walls of Tangbochi Monastery. Then his father repainted them after the great earthquake more than 40 years ago. Then he in his turn added to them. He said that he struggles not for innovation or for change, but for continuity. The themes that he paints and the styles that he uses are in direct line with the Nepalese artists of the last 1,200 years. In these pictures, every line, every form, every color has a precise symbolic meaning for the initiate. White for heavenly purity, blue for the demigods, yellow for the human state, green for the animals, black for the devils. You can find a painting of the Wheel of Life on the porch of every Tibetan temple. It shows how the blind urges of an unenlightened existence drive beings round and round into an unending cycle of births and deaths. At the center of the wheel are three figures that represent greed, hatred, and ignorance. They're seen as the driving force that turns the wheel. Liberation from the wheel can only be achieved by those who follow the Buddha's path and transform sensual desire into the search for truth and knowledge. Like many of the great religious painters of the Renaissance, he spends as much of his time in prayer and meditation as he does in painting. For him, religion and his work fuse into one whole. His only contact with Western art is through advertisements cut out of the glossy magazines that somehow get carried up the Everest Trail. He says that he admires the skill, but not the subjects. He's made lots of paintings of Tangbocha Monastery with Everest in the background. This one was made into a UNICEF Christmas card. He uses a sort of visual shorthand to describe a scene that would have taxed a turner in full flood. The monastery comes to life just after sunrise. ago, gongs like these would have been echoing all over Tibet. Now there's just this narrow strip of the world where tantric Buddhism still survives untouched. clustered round the central courtyard of the monastery. They cook for themselves and live by themselves. Compared with a Western monastery, they lead strangely independent and isolated lives, coming together for prayers in the early morning, but for little else. The monks only take meals as a community on special occasions. The main function of the kitchen seems to be to prepare tea churned with butter and salt. The 
teas an acquired taste, but it's the only thing they have to sustain them through ceremonies that may go on for up to eight hours. For the monks, music isn't there just to embellish or beautify their prayers. It has as much significance and power as the words themselves. One of the masters of Tibetan music said that they believe, like Pythagoras, that all beings or things produce sounds according to their nature. Because beings or things are aggregates of atoms that dance, each atom perpetually sings its own song. speaking, the monks are only supposed to do a limited amount of manual work, but this monastery is too poor to employ many lay servants, and so the novices have to work their passage. There's no caste system in the Sherpa villages, but for some reason the blacksmith ranks very low on the social pecking order, just above a butcher, and he's virtually an outcast in a Buddhist society. This blacksmith had his forge in the monastery courtyard.
The duties in the monastery are divided up so that one monk is in charge of discipline, another of running the household, and three monks run the accounts in unison. Inside the temple, there's not an inch of bare wood to be seen on the walls. Everything's painted, and the subjects are not artistic improvisations on themes from the Bible, as you might find in our churches. They're formalized reflections of the images that the monks will use in meditation. Lining the walls in the monastery library are pigeonholes containing the 108 volumes of the Tibetan canon and the 225 volumes of the commentaries. When they told me this, I began to see why it takes 20 years to turn out a doctor of philosophy. This young monk is reading a treatise on medicine. Again, as in medieval Europe, the monasteries in Tibet trained doctors as well as theologians. The young Sherpa monks have to speak and read fluently in Tibetan. Many of the books here were brought over from Rongfu after the Chinese invaded Tibet. Some of them are 700 or more years old. They're printed by woodblock in the Tibetan script. Next to the monastery, there's a guest house where itinerant monks often spend the night. And as soon as it's light enough to see, you hear the sound of the bell that marks each turn of the prayer wheel. One of the impressive things about the monastery is the way that the monks retain their individuality. They're there of their own free will, free to come and go as they please. As with their meditation, discipline is very much a personal affair. The main allegiance that they owe is to their teacher, in many ways more influential in shaping their lives than the abbot of the monastery. He's a reincarnation of a previous abbot from Tangboche's sister monastery of Rongfu, just on the other side of the Tibetan border. This morning was of special importance to him. His teacher, a Tibetan, who he hadn't seen for more than a year, was coming to visit him. The teacher was himself the abbot of a monastery some 60 miles to the south. It seemed an almost unbelievable moment when these two representatives of an old and unchanging society were brought together by a helicopter. Yet everyone seemed to accept that it was as natural for the wind to bring him here as it was for it to fill the prayer flags.
The helicopter was provided by courtesy of the Italian team that had just climbed Everest. They had visited Tangboche on their way through to the Everest base camp and had offered to save the visiting abbot from a six-day walk. Among the Sherpas and the Tibetans, it's traditional to greet visitors with the gift of a white cotton scarf. For the villagers who come here to be blessed, this is as much a social occasion as a spiritual one. But for the monks, the real essence of Buddhism isn't here, but in their meditation, in the search for nirvana, which can be translated as a blowing away, extinction, disappearance, emptiness. It seems so impossible to define in words that the nearest perhaps are those of the Buddha, the roaring silence. <laughs> 